You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And we are joined by Daniel Fri- Daniele Fribrincini. Hello, chaps. <laughs> Is that catching on or, or not? No, few more that weeks. was me sounding. I know you can't see me, but that was me no, sounding unimpressed. Nonplussed. Nonplussed. Very much unimpressed. You're, you're in, well, are you in a secret location, Daniel, or are you... No, 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 no. I mean, the Stasi, the Stasi were taken out of service a few years ago, Rich. I'm in Berlin, and, and everyone <laughs> is allowed to know about it. Great. Well, we're in, we're in the South Bank. There were helicopters last week and skateboards today, Lionel. Did the UCI have jurisdiction on skateboards? They, they, were, they were arguing about that, weren't they? They were. A, a few years ago, weren't they? The UCI felt that skateboarding should come under their auspices. And I remember a colleague of mine joking whether wheeled suitcase racing would also come <laughs> under the UCI, uh, the UCI regulations, uh, seeing as they were trying to claim that anything that didn't have a motor but which had wheels should be governed by And yet they're also now the UCI. trying to govern bikes with motors as they well. They are. So yeah. What about wow. suitcase, Careful suitcases there, with motors? Careful there, Richard. They check the bikes very carefully with an iPad to make sure no, there's no, no motors in you them. You know perfectly well what I'm talking about, uh, Lionel, e-bikes. But anyway, the big news this week um, is the announcement today, we're speaking on Tuesday, the announcement this morning of the Tour de France route for 2020. We'll be talking about that in this episode. Uh, we'll also be looking back on Il Lombardia at the weekend, maybe Paris Tour as well. Um, we're going to hear from Egan Bernal, uh, who I went to interview last week just before Il Lombardia. But before we crack on with any of that, um, we want to give a, a, an early shout out for our tour, our own grand tour next month. Um, it starts on November the 11th in Bristol. And uh, we haven't actually confirmed to date our lineup for our shows. So um, for the first week of the shows, that's Bristol on the 11th of November, uh, then Cardiff, Worcester, Dublin and Belfast. It's going to be, be myself, Lionel Burney, Orla Shinoui, making a triumphant homecoming to uh, Belfast, no doubt, and Francois Tomaso. Um, the next batch of shows, uh, which there are two in London, and then... Uh, where do we go after London? Cambridge, Edinburgh, Leicester and Manchester. That's right. Uh, that will be me, Lionel and Daniele Friberancini. So the, eight, uh, so the A team, that'll be the, eight, that'll be the A team is what you're trying to say. The big guns the, coming in for the second yeah, half. Yeah. yeah, well, you could put it like that. I mean, we'll probably present it slightly differently when we're doing the podcast with Francois and Orla. Um, <laughs> but we're going to have one or two special guests as well, which we'll announce next week. But tickets are still available. One or two shows very close to selling out, in particular Belfast and Edinburgh. Um, but go to the cyclingpodcast.com and uh, click on live events to get your tickets and try and get them before uh, we announce our special guest next week for one or two of the shows. Um, the, the tour coincides with the publication of our second book, uh, The Grand Tour Diaries, which will be out in early November. And if you come to the show, you can get it at a discounted price. So that's, um, well, that's just gone away to the printers and uh, very exciting. I've been reading it the last few days. You've been reading it as well, Lionel, I I've think. I've been chortling at my own jokes, Richard, as you would, uh, as you would no doubt expect. No less. Yes, well, anyway, all that. So th- you can also, I think, buy the book b- before coming to the show and pick it up at the show and we'll have a we'll system have, yeah, for that we'll have we? a system for that in place by next week hopefully but yeah sort of click and collect type system we're very modern aren't we you can you can buy it in advance and just collect it on the night um to, just to make it easy i guess and i mean just a a, a little uh, uh, footnote to that is that stacy snyder the ceramicist who made these beautiful mugs for us all this year she emailed me the other day and she has booked a flight over from Washington to London to come to the show on the 25th of November. Um, she's coming for three days. She's going to pack in a few museums and art galleries in London. Um, but that's going to be delightful. We've met her before. We're going to go out for lunch with her and meet her properly. And uh, she's, um, well, she had a lot to the experience of doing the podcast this year. And I know a lot of you are proud owners of the Cycling Podcast mugs. So 
we'll be looking forward to meeting her at one of the shows. Pressure's on there, isn't it? Just knowing somebody's coming all the way from the US of A to come and see us. We'd better be good that night. We'll be good every night, though, won't we? Hopefully. That's the plan, Lionel. Um, do we have a news roundup at all, Lionel? Indeed. Well, you mentioned Il Lombardia, the final monument of the season, and Balka Molima's first monument. We'll talk about that in uh, which part did we decide? The second part? The, well, the part after we do the Tour de France. Right. right. So we'll talk about Balka Molima's win and, uh, well, the tactics of the riders in the, the chase group behind. Um, the following day, Paris Tour was won by Yellow Wallace of Lotto Sudal. It's the second time he's won Paris Tour. Uh, he's also won the under-23 edition in the past. Um, really entertaining couple of hours racing, I thought, watching them go through the vineyards on the gravelly tracks. Nicky Terpstra was second, his first big result since crashing out of the Tour de France in July and Oliver Narsen was third we posed the question last week whether anyone would ride both Il Lombardia and Paris Tour and well Rory Sutherland completed Il Lombardia on Saturday and then took a late flight from I think Milan to Paris and then got himself down to Chartres for the, the start on Sunday morning because UAE Team Emirates needed him to re- reach the minimum five starters for the race um, and being the kind of the old man of the team uh, perhaps the one who might complain the least he uh, had the, the job of riding uh, two races, two you know difficult races back to back. He didn't finish Paris Tour because he crashed in the uh, fairly early on in the race. Um, the build-up races to Il Lombardia continued this stretch of one day races uh, has really kind of captured the imagination in the past couple of years Michael Woods won Milano Torino and Egan Bernal won Gran Piemonte and obviously they were in the final shake up on Saturday as well last week we were talking about the Grand Prix Bruno Begelli and Rob Taylor writes to say that Bruno Begelli is a local businessman based in Montevideo a town outside Bologna which is where the race is, um, starts and finishes and uh, there are an electrical company they make electrical things so uh, that solves the mystery of who Bruno Begelli was I was racking my brains thinking was it a a winner of the the Giro from the very early days or something but no he's he's a businessman who sponsors the race Uh, also some racing in France Marc Sarro who won the Tour de Vendée last week added Paris Bourges and Dylan Groenewegen won the Tax Pro Classic also known as the Ronde van Zeeland in the Netherlands now three of the greats from the 60s and 70s uh, Eddie Merckx, Ramon Poulidor and Roger de Vlaminck have all had spells in hospital. Eddie Merckx crashed while riding his bike in Belgium on Sunday and has sustained a head injury and has been kept in for observation. Ramon Poulidor has been in hospital as well, uh, 83 years old. He's been not feeling his best since uh, July, apparently, where he works at the Tour as a um, well, an ambassador, ambassador yeah. for Credit Lyonnais, the bank that sponsors the yellow jersey. He's, of course, the grandfather of Matthew van der Poel. And Roger de Vlaminck has been in hospital with a fever as well so uh, well best wishes to all of them as they uh, are on the road to recovery um, that's about it for the news roundup other than the big news which is the Tour de France route launch and the very early um, bid by Chris Froome to get one up on Egan Bernal by saying that Bernal's told him already that he's going to support Froome at the 2020 Tour de France well just before we go on to that Lionel um, you mentioned Michael Woods win at Milano Torino we watched that last week and I had a quick word with him at the start of Il Lombardia uh, just to ask him what that victory meant yeah I actually talked to Stephen Ferrand I think the day before in an interview talking about how I've missed some opportunities with wins because I was uh, I try I try and win in a certain way I don't I don't like sitting back I like being aggressive and uh, to have won in an aggressive action like that was uh, special for me do you enjoy these races this week I love these races they're so dynamic uh, I like the circuits I like how interesting and intriguing the courses are and for me, I'm far better when I'm engaged the entire time instead of riding on this flat road. Uh, I love it when there's constant undulation, constant turning. Uh, I really thrive in those environments, and that's why I really like these races. And a really nice way to finish the season, I guess. You finish with a win, and uh, you go into the, the winter feeling probably pretty happy with your season, do you? Yeah, I think I was pretty satisfied with the season prior to this, these races. I wasn't ecstatic just because I didn't have a big win. But now I, I consider Milan and Torino a big win. And, uh, uh, yeah, I can finish the season quite content. Uh, the rest now, today, and uh, even Japan Cup, is just if I get a result at those races, it'll be icing on the cake. Do you regard it then as a, a sort of more, more progress this year, um, another, another step forward? 
Yeah, I think winning at the Vuelta was a, was a big accomplishment. Coming third at the World Championships was a big accomplishment. But I still hadn't beaten the best guys on the day in a, a one-day race. Uh, and although it wasn't a, a monument, uh, Milano Torino, like you look at the field and it was a World Tour race. Uh, just the quality field uh, and the guy that I'm, uh, the guy that was second is Alejandro Valverde. So to have won finally at that level, uh, I think is a step up. And uh, looking ahead to next year, what what are your are you, are you thought already about what your goals might be next year? Uh, yeah, I'm already looking towards uh, next year for sure. I think the Olympics is a huge goal for me, uh, particularly just because I come from athletics background. I really high uh, hold uh, the Olympics on, on high regard. And also the World Championships, if you look at that, that course, it really suits me. So two big targets for me next year are going to be those races. The fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Yes, thank you very much indeed to our title sponsor, Rafa. And uh, well, we heard from a man in Rafa just before the break there, Michael Woods, uh, the EF Education First rider, who, uh, well, uh, Il Lombardia didn't go quite so well for him, but he won, uh, to, as he said there, very pleased indeed to take his first sort of big one day race in Milano Torino uh, but the big news today and this week um, earlier than usual the announcement of the, the Tour de France route for next year it is earlier I think and I was told by somebody I don't know if this is true or not that one of the reasons might have been because Egan Bernal was still in Europe and uh, this might have been the last chance to, to get him um, There, I mean the, the route itself we'll talk about that but I'm always interested to watch the presentation um, which doesn't really change it's always in the same place but the way that they use the riders and introduce the riders there are subtle uh, changes to that every year Um, we always look with interest at what the riders are wearing Um, Thibaut Pino's white shoes with his white trainers with his suit what did we think of that Um, Roman Bardet a very relaxed look for Roman Bardet I mean Daniel you're our you're our kind of fashionista um, what did you make of the riders' outfits? Um, I, I, to be honest, I haven't seen them all. Um, I saw a few pictures. Um, I saw a few descriptions of them, looking well, as though saying they looked as though they'd, you know, turned up for their first work experience day out of sixth form college. I, I could see where people were coming from. I saw that Egan Bernal had a natty handkerchief. Or quite, he was looking quite. Um, elegant. Uh, Roman Bardet, he's a bit too young to be kitted out in a, in a sort of beige brown turtleneck. I mean, it's the kind of look that I, I could pull off, but I'm not sure about Roman Bardet. I mean, I know his, his Tour de France career, um, <laughs> well, it, it's not on the trajectory that he would like it to be on, but he's still, you know, he's in his 20s. Yeah. Um, um, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't need to go off delivering milk tray just yet. <laughs> Chris Froome has, uh, has smartened up his act. He looked, he looked, he looked, um, he looked quite smart today, I, I thought. Um, but uh, I, I was quite impressed with the way that Bernal uh, sort of came on stage last and uh, the way that he uh, sort of addressed the crowd and the way he carried himself. I thought for a 22-year-old, obviously a Tour de France winner, but um, he, uh, he, 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 did, he did that pretty well, I thought. Um, gave, the, gave a big sort of uh, quite, um, quite, a, quite a bow to the crowd and, and got a great response. Um, but that's not the important business, of course, how the riders, how the riders looked. Uh, the important business is what they will be riding next year. Every year, um, they say it's the hardest route ever. Or, you know, it, it seems to be um, last year was the highest ever. This year, uh, it's not certainly not the longest ever, uh, quite short stages. And the, the main talking point is probably the, the time trial at the, on the penultimate day to La Planche de Belfi, which will not go along the dirt road that they went along to finish the stage this year but we'll finish at the more familiar um, finish that we've had the last few years um, that's the, the main thing that's the only time trial in the race um, early mountain stages but a lot for the sprinters as well I mean what are your first impressions Daniel? Well Rich and the first impression when you look at the route is that it's more um, I've just said to someone on Twitter it's more biggie than two pack it's more Sorry, it's more two-pack than Biggie. It's more south than north. Um, it's more, it's more chocolatine than pain au chocolat. You get that reference, Napalm? Yeah. Yeah, we Pre- do actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the south, yeah, the, the, well, there are big, big areas of the south where pain au chocolat is known as a chocolatine. Um, 
apparently. Where um, were I'm we not... with Francois when that was the case? What, it was a re- it was a rest day. In yeah, the oh. it was the day you went to meet Jonathan Vauters. Where was that? In uh, oh god, southwest. It would have been it probably was southwest. Yeah. Southwest. Yeah. Uh, well, you yeah. were. It was around Albi. Uh, the stage had finished in Albi the previous day. Yeah. But um, Gayak. less Gayak. less sort of frivolously um, facetiously, I would say that. Um, uh, a couple of people have referred to the tours of weltification, um, and I would say that's pretty accurate, both in the sense that um, the stages are noticeably shorter than usual, or there are, well, I think there's only one stage above 200 kilometers. Um, also, we've talked a lot in this year's Welter about how it was difficult to sort of orientate oneself because there were no sort of noticeable big blocks in a single range of mountains. The sort of m- mountains were sprinkled throughout the race, um, and that is the case in this Tour de France. There are the route is going to visit all five of the main massifs in France, so Alps, Pyrenees, Jura, the Massif Central, and the Vosges. Um, not in that order. But it, it's going to, well, it's, it'll be broken up very quickly, probably from the first day. Um, there are the hills on the first stage. Um, certainly on the second stage, there are, there are some quite big hills, some big climbs. Um, and, you know, that might lead to, well, the sort of peloton settling down, being a bit less stressed, maybe fewer crashes. That's at least been the conventional wisdom for a few years now that a route like this would have that kind of effect. Um, in that sense, it might suit someone like Thibaut Pino, who I noticed um, in his comments about the route, well, he, he seems delighted. But, um, you, you know, he'll be happy that the sort of cream rises to the top quite quickly. There'll be maybe less sort of fighting for position among the GC guys on the, on the flatter stages. On the other hand, though, mentally, it might make it even more taxing because... Um, um, again, much as was the case during the Vuelta, it's difficult to look at the route and just say, right, that's a GC day, that's a GC day, and then we've got five when we're, all we have to do is sort of rest in the bunch, and then um, and then we'll we'll sort of fight it out again. Um, it's pretty much looking at the route. Um, something could happen almost every day, um, and that, as I say, for for someone like Pino, who you know, up until well. Two and a half weeks of the two and a half weeks of this year's tour struggle to really put all three weeks together um, might be a bit of a concern. There are a lot of days there that have to be negotiated. A lot of time when a rider is going to have to be at peak fitness and not get ill, not crash, um, and not um, come unstuck in some other way. Just on that on that opening weekend, I mean, it's a it's a flat stage. Uh, well, described as a flat stage, stage one. It's quite quite hard, but we imagine that would be a a sprinter's day, but stage two, um, is it, how similar is it? I think it's harder than the traditional final day of Paris-Nice, but it also uses a, a circuit, so they're going to be doing some, some laps of Nice at the end, and uh, that could be a really interesting day. Um, it reminds me a bit of the 92 Tour de France, which started in San Sebastian, and you know, day two, we had a, a mountain stage already, and you saw the big guns then, Ingerain, Bugno, Chiapucci, all kind of on the front and, and uh, you know, riding away. And that's interesting from the point of view, too, of, of riders sort of being in form through, for, for the whole three weeks and being on it for three weeks. I mean, do you know at this stage how hard, just how hard that second stage is? Well, it's difficult, Rich, um, at the moment, just to assess the, the difficulty of, of all the stages because there aren't many of the, the climb profiles available. Um, but those two climbs, the um, what's the first one? Is it the Col uh, Colmian and the Turini are um, well, they're big climbs. I mean, they're, they're longish climbs, um, not not terribly steep, and they're a long way from the finish. Um, but they come early in the stage and then we've got um, the cold airs and um, as you say a sort of fairly traditional looking route into Nice but I think you know something will happen um, as far as general classification is concerned there will certainly be some skirmishes I mean the, the sort of trajectory of that early part of the race reminds me a little bit of 2009 when it started in Corsica um, the difference being that where Monaco Monaco sorry 2000 no Corsica oh and 13 yeah, um, when the difference being that in 2013 the, 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 the sort of race forked left and hugged the coast and sort of went to the Pyrenees 
that way whereas um, next year it's going to turn inland and, and it's going to head into sort of some even more mountainous terrain and, and into the bottom half of the Alps and there's a, there's a first summit finish at Orsia uh, Miaulet on stage four and then there's another mountaintop finish at Mont Aiguel on stage six and that's all before the race gets to the Pyrenees so um, I mean I think as far as first weeks are concerned it's probably the most mountainous we've ever seen I think the uphill there's an uphill finish at Privas as well isn't there on stage five Correct, so actually yeah. three three sort of pretty tricky days in a row Orsier Mallet is one of those places that um, uh, just stands out to me because it was uh, the place during the 1989 Tour de France where Stephen Rooks won the mountain time trial there and Greg LeMond took the yellow jersey um, back and uh, that, that's always stuck in my mind but the, that first week and in fact the, the whole tour really looks looks to me to be almost a sort of tour detention it's it's not there's no real kind copyright of, Lionel well, Bernie it, it's it's stress from day one all the way through that first week really um, everyone will be looking at stage seven to be the uh, the now traditional the one to lave our the, the now traditional boring flat stage that Dylan Groenewegen wins on the first Friday of the tour that's that's now happened since records began I think <laughs> it certainly feels like that anyway after the last two years and then um, then it's kind of quick quick slow again isn't it with the, with the mountains being broken up by um, stages that, that that may or may not cause um, you know cause difficulty. I think the one to Ile de Ray, Well, if the wind blows there off the Atlantic, you know that's uh, that's been put in there to cause mischief rather than um, rather than anything else. Absolutely beautiful. That's yeah. gonna. That's y- yeah. The island to island stage. I think the first time that's ever been done. Um, and uh, it's, the tour has never been to Ile de Ray before. I don't believe. Napalm, you mentioned. Um, Groenewegen and Jumbo Visma I mean it's the kind of route in the kind of first week where you think that uh, a team that is coming in with multiple objectives and is coming in or that thinks they might come in with a sprinter and general classification riders might actually think twice about taking their sprinter uh, I'm mm. thinking particularly about Jumbo Visma we know that um, Dumoulin is, is joining them and he, he's going to be well he'll have looked at um, with interest at the route today. They've also got Roglic, of course, Kreiswijk, but they also have Mike Toynesen and Wout van Aert, who showed in this year's tour they can win stages in sprints and they can also probably do more of a job for a general classification rider than Dylan Groenewegen. And I just wonder whether a rider like that might find his position in the, in the starting line slightly imperiled on, on a route like this. That's a very good point, but one that we probably won't know the answer to until we see the the roots of the Giro and perhaps to a lesser extent the the Vuelta as well. But um, that's always the thing with the tour route, isn't it? We the sort of knee jerk snap judgment on the day the route is announced ranges from it's the best tour ever to it's the worst tour ever, and um, it's a it's a funny one. This I can't quite get a handle on on what it is because it isn't it isn't peppered with kind of famous. Um, summit fin- finishes really. There's a few. There's a few interesting new ones. The Col de la Lose will be really interesting. That's pretty high, 2,300 meters. The final six kilometers are on a, a basically a car-free road. So that uh, on what looks like beautiful new tarmac, um, and it, it connects Maribel and Courcheval, doesn't it? Mm. I've, I've skied there, um, and and you know the roads connections aren't weren't great. So I was interested to see this this new climb. A finish on the Grand Colombier just before that as well that will be interesting and then the the stage w- uh, which goes over the Corme de Rosaland the Col de Saisy and also the Plateau de Glières, which is where well that was on the route when uh, Julian Alaphilippe won a stage a couple of years ago and th- it, it's a kind of a it's a sort of Alaphilippe Pinot route isn't it I was going to say from <laughs> yeah. start to finish Francois will roll his the, eyes at that but. yeah especially with the with the, the time trial on La Planche de Belfi which again it, it's a familiar road Road, but being a time trial, well, we've never seen that before, so we don't know how what impact that will have. Whether that will lead to a kind of cagey, cautious race because everyone will wait for the time trial at the end, or whether it will have the complete opposite effect. I mean, at the moment, we are we really are in sort of guesswork territory. But I I like the look of it. I like the fact that um, that the first sort of proper mountain stage is not 
the first climbing as well. I think that's something that, that we haven't really seen in, in recent years. The, the one to Orsier Mallet won't be the first time they go uphill, so it won't be that sort of shock to the system, perhaps. So we could see quite a quite a racy first week. Shoot, uh, shoot that arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. We've been interrupted there by Seb Piquet, the voice of Race Radio at the Tour de France, of course. And that's to remind me to tell you that this week's episode is sponsored by LACA, uh, returning LACA. Lionel, what can you tell us about LACA? Well, Rich, LACA is a smarter way of ensuring your bikes and gear. It's a community of cyclists joining together to play fair and take good care in order to save each other money. LACA covers all the basics you'd expect, theft, accidental loss and damage, both at home and abroad. And it also covers you in sportives and races, as long as you're not riding in the pro peloton. They're not going to start insuring the World Tour teams. Instead of charging you a fixed premium, you only pay a small share of the community's claim costs. And your share is proportionate to how much you insure yourself with LACA. So while your share can theoretically go down to naught pounds if there are no claims in a particular month, LACA also locks in a maximum price to ensure that there are no nasty surprises, even in months when there are lots of claims. Claims are accepted quickly, usually within a day. But don't take our word for it. Let's hear from one of LACA's customers who had to make a claim while riding his bike on holiday. I've travelled a lot over the last year internationally with my bike. I, I took it to my wife's chagrin on every holiday I went on and spent a lot of time cycling. I'm Philip Meyer. I've been a LACA customer since April 2018. I tried to ride about 150 to 200 kilometers a week. I went out on actually what turned out to be the longest cycle I've ever done. Well, it was the longest at the time. About halfway through the 150k ride, the third party mount that I had for my cycling computer broke for no apparent reason my cycling computer flew into the air catapulted along and landed on the floor and just smashed into pieces so i was pretty distraught mainly actually about the fact it wasn't going to record my ride rather than the fact that um (laughs) that it was broken but it was a pretty expensive piece of kit so i followed up with lacquer that afternoon i used their app then actually followed up with them on the phone because i wasn't quite sure what to do i had a brilliant experience i I can't say how positive and helpful they were and i told them that you know i was away cycling i needed this um, there's no way i could survive without a cycling computer and so i went to the shop the next day and just bought a replacement it was expensive 590 quid i think it cost sent them the receipt i mean i was really surprised because the money was back in my account by the time i went to bed that evening and actually i'd sent them the receipt i'd also bought a pair of socks i couldn't resist and they paid me back for the socks as well as a as as a way of sort of sympathizing with me i guess anyway so it was really positive experience Uh, they were so friendly so helpful and i i was just stunned having had other insurance claims in the past which took forever and where you almost made feel like a criminal these guys were just positive friendly and went out of their way to help me you know and it was an expensive piece of kit so it would have been a pain on holiday to have been short of that money Lacquer's members have saved 61% on their bike insurance and that's money that could be spent on a new piece of kit or put towards a training camp or a cycling holiday so if you want to find out more about Lacquer go to lacquer.co.uk that's l-a-k-a.co.uk just carrying on with the, the route of the tour next year, um, much was made of the fact there's only one time trial in the race, but it's quite a long time trial. I mean, everybody again is talking about the, the climb up to La Plonge de Belfi, um, but 36 kilometres starting from your favourite town, Lionel, Lure. Yeah, seen the, the scene of a famous barbecue a couple of years ago. Where the, the man with a missing finger offered us a barbecue. <laughs> and we declined it and went into town and had a very average meal. Well, we declined it on the basis that you you believed that he must have chopped off his finger preparing our meat and that you, you weren't prepared <laughs> to eat a barbecued finger. Uh, so we, we missed out on that. But uh, starting in Lure, finishing at La Ponce de Belfi and... It's a gamble, isn't it, by the organisers? It's a gamble because that will be really exciting if the race is still very close. Um, But as we saw at La Ponce de Belfi, admittedly with the extra bit tacked on this year, uh, it's a tough climb and it's going to be hard for riders to really know how to judge that effort. Um, It's also the longest individual time trial in the Tour since 2016 uh, when Tom de Moula won the long time trial. And I think... Um, he will look at that time trial with some relish. The climb as well, I think, suits him. 
Yeah, I see what you're saying, Rich. Um, but it's not just a long time trial, is it? It's a it's a mountain time trial. It's a proper mountain time trial. We haven't seen a, a real proper mountain time trial for how long? Alp Duez, yeah. uh, Armstrong, 2000. And what year was that? Five. <laughs> Four, yeah. four. There's been there's been sort of uphill time trials and very difficult time trials, but on a, on a proper kind of category one or bigger climb, we, we haven't really seen that for a long time, and so that will be that will be interesting. It's it's almost like the sort of the cork in the bottle um, of champagne. The thing is whether or not the race dislodges the cork over the three weeks enough that that we might get a real explosion of fizz on that final Saturday, or whether the, the, it's a bit of a well, we d- we don't see any bubbles because the, the cork remains firmly lodged in the bottle because the race is done and dusted. I mean, I look at that stage 19 um, to Champagnol the day before the sort of sprint stage, just stuck in there between two mountain tests. Obviously, that's something we've talked about um, the the way that in recent years it seemed that the 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 tour route has has sought to kind of unsettle the rhythm for riders so they go from riding big gears one day small gears the next day climbing then flat then climbing again that's the sort of thing that some riders don't respond too well to and and it might lead to um quite an an interesting final time trial but if the race is done and dusted going into that friday that's that's the sort of stage where everyone feels slightly deflated don't they but I mean, we d- we just don't know. There's there's so much that could happen, um, and I think, you know, rather than uh, you know, I think this is probably as close to the kind of the fantasy medium challenge of the Tour de France as, as we're Sagan, realistically Sagan likely, likely to get. Lionel, uh, not sure about that, <laughs> but Julian Alaphilippe could. Well, we're going to hear actually from the defending champion, the winner of this year's Tour de France, Egan Bernal, and Chris Froome, both at the presentation in Paris today. Uh, Francois Tomizo was there, and uh, he sent us a couple of clips from both of them reacting to the route. Let's hear from Bernal first. Um, he's asked initially what he thinks of, of the course, and then we'll hear from Chris Froome. It's Seb Piquet asking him the questions, and uh, uh, Froome starts off talking about how he's getting on in his convalescence after his crash earlier this year at the Dauphiné Libre. To be honest, I, I don't remember too much because it was too fast, but uh, so far I think that it will be really hard. It's an atypic uh, course without the tam tam team tam trial and with just one tam trial and the 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 final is in 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 uphill really steep so it will be like like a little bit different Uh, but yeah i really like and i think that the people also will like because uh, i think that uh, will give a lot of emotions with the steep climbs and with attacks so i think that it will be great for the for the people I am a climber, so I prefer to, to have this this kind of uh, stages. Uh, like I said before, I really like the the, the percourse, and yeah, I think that it uh, will be a different uh, tour, uh, really really hard with the uh, steep climb. So uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Much better, thanks. Doing much better. I'm on a, on, on the road to recovery still. Um, I've made it back onto the bike in this last month, which has been fantastic. Um, still a little bit shaky on my on my feet, but uh, heading there, heading in the right direction. I've um, I've still got a plate on my hip that I, I need to get removed soon, um, and once that comes off, hopefully things will will start to improve a little bit faster. And already focused on the Tour de France. A word on on that course that you uh, just discovered. Yeah, I mean that 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 uh, course for next year is brutal. It's uh, it's probably the hardest tour route I've seen in the last five six years. Um, a lot of climbing uh, elevation meters. Um, a, a lot of opportunities, really, is the way I see it. A lot of opportunities for, to, for the general classification to play out. So it should be a really exciting exciting tour. And then, obviously, with the sting in the tail on, on stage 20 with the, the time trial, 36-kilometer uh, time trial finishing up La Planche de Belfi is just going to be... I mean, we haven't seen anything like that for, for decades. And you'll be at home uh, at the beginning. That's also a bonus for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, starting on uh, roads that we're really f- familiar with around Nice, uh, it's fantastic, fantastic for us and and the team. And um, certainly looking forward to to being there. And many options within the team. Uh, you, of course, uh, the title holder, uh, Garen Thomas. That's also fantastic for the team. But it's a bit tricky. 
<laughs> I mean, we've got a we've got a, an amazing lineup, amazing lineup, amazing roster of riders to to select from. So I mean, nothing's decided yet. Um, I mean, for me personally, I've I've obviously got to get myself back to that level before even discussing leadership or anything like that. But um, at least for now, everything's headed in the right direction, and uh, we're we're optimistic. So that was uh, Egan Bernal, the winner of this year's tour, and Chris Froome, the four-time winner of the tour, and. Uh, from not being drawn there on the question of who will lead the team, although there have been stories already, and this will be a recurring theme over the next few months uh, about who will lead the, the team. I mean, uh, Bernal, I mean, I asked him about this as well when I met him last week. We're going to hear from him again a little bit later in the episode, um, but that's for a, 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 an interview that you'll hear later on. Um, Bernal, you know, is clearly in pole position, and Froome will have to prove that he is capable of riding at the, that level again won't he? Well yeah I mean it's quite a comeback isn't it to be off out of competition say Froome comes back in February or March that's um, that's a three quarters of a year out of action isn't it so yeah a lot to a lot to prove um, before he even gets back into racing really Well Lionel as well as uh, the route presentation today in Paris big day for the Tour de France day because our road trip is released now during this year's tour we recorded bits and pieces as we went from our live show in Brussels all the way through to Paris um, various meandering off-piste conversations between you, me and Francois Tomaso. Mm. Uh, we weren't travelling with Daniel sadly of course but um, we recorded a lot of material and it's a two-part Friends special that is being released to coincide with the announcement of the 2020 route Yes, um, well, not a lot of cycling chat in the road trip, really, a is it? Bit. There's a bit, there's a bit. I don't want to put people off. I mean, or maybe it will entice people to listen. Um, but we talk about lots of other things that are, uh, well, everything kind of related to the experience of covering the Tour de France and travelling around France. And, uh, well, it's, I guess it's kind of like eavesdropping on us in the cycling podcast team car and around the dinner table. I mean, you, you're, you know, you, you're very, you're very, you're very humble man, Lionel. Um, and I know you don't want to big up your, your ability to impersonate um, oh, others, no. but <laughs> your Alex Dowsa impression is, is wonderful. And there's another impression as well. I can't remember. Who else do you do? I've forgotten now. Let the, let the listeners uh, discover this. Al- Alex Dowsett as Adam Buxton's dog Rosie oh, is just quite. Oh, it, don't you reveal. Get, you don't to, stitch yeah. me up. You yeah. have to listen to that. It's oh. great. It's great. Listen, just before we um, stop talking about the Tour de France route, um, one word about La Course, uh, which um, goes back to Paris next year. Uh, there was quite a lot of talk in the in the preamble uh, to the presentation about women's cycling and how ESO were committed to it. And there were quite a few uh, female riders there. I noticed Cecilia Utrip ludwig was there. She actually has just uh, announced that she's riding for FTJ next year. She's moving from Bigla to FTJ. Um, but going back to Paris, I think, is a, is, a, is a bit of a backward step because, of course, when they've taken it out, well, to Po this year in particular, but also um, the, the stage uh, last year that was won by Annemiek van Vluten to Grand Bernon, um, they, that was fantastic. The additions that have been held on the Champs-Élysées are basically uh, criteriums, and they're not, they're not great. They're, they work for the sprinters, but um, it's a backward step. But on the other hand, ASO did tell Julien Proto of Reuters this year at the Tour that they are looking to set up a standalone stage race for women at a time of year uh, where it doesn't clash with the Tour de France. So we await news on that and I think that would be a far more exciting development than whatever they do with La Course because it's always going to be quite limited. Yeah, but I think there's impatience about these plans, isn't there? And, um, well, I completely understand if ASO aren't ready to unveil anything at the moment. Um, But it does feel a as you say, it's a it's a backward step. Um, La Course in Paris is uh, well, it's it's not quite after the Lord Mayor's show, is it? But it's it's pretty damn close to that. It's um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a shame. But you know, let's not let's not prejudge. Let's wait and see um, what gets announced in the next uh, next few months. Hopefully, the cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. I am Egan Bernal, I ride for Team Ineos and my favourite product of science in sport is uh, the caffeine gel. 
Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting the cycling podcast. And we heard there from none other than uh, defending Tour de France champion, uh, the winner this year, Egan Bernal, telling us his favourite Science and Sport product. Um, you can get 25% off your Science and Sport products for yourself at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25 that is SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com if like Egan Bernal you want to stock up on caffeine gels um, now the big race at the weekend was Il Lombardia on Saturday Paris Tour also on Sunday uh, brought the kind of curtain down on the European road season I was at the start of Il Lombardia I was out there doing some interviews including with Bernal and we'll hear a little bit from him again in a moment um, but uh, I couldn't go to the finish in Como unfortunately because so I had to come home um, but I was at the start of Lombardia and, and I was able to watch the race as well and it was a fascinating uh, finale really wasn't it because Balcomolo one of these riders who's won quite a lot in situations like that he's pretty good when he gets away even if he looks ragged he's pretty effective and it was a, a classic case of one of the not very you know not not really fancied riders sneaking away and all the favorites looking at each other uh, to to chase him back and you know Bernal Roglic uh, Valverde they wouldn't have been able to to get away in the way that Molima did you know he used his sort of underdog status to to get away and then once he was away uh, he really took advantage of the the hesitation and the games that were being played behind so it was really fascinating because you were watching it thinking this guy's probably not the strongest guy in this race or the fastest but um he's he's playing his his hand absolutely brilliantly and the others are kind of throwing it away do you think that was because the others would think I'm not going to use my energy here chasing Balcom Olimar because if I use my energy here and then Roglic goes, say, um, if that's what Valverde's thinking, then they basically they basically wasted uh, valuable energy at a crucial time in the race. It was the obvious thing for Molima to do, um, get out in front and, and see whether anyone chased, knowing that if people bridged up to him, um, you know, he might still have a second bite of the cherry. But he won the classic of San Sebastian a few years ago in a very similar style and his Tour de France stage win in 2017 was not dissimilar either um, so yeah a dangerous man just to let off the leash there and really it was that hesitation and, and the the, the well, the, the late reaction from Primoz Roglic, because if he'd gone well, even 15 minutes earlier, he might have had more of a chance of, um, of, of getting on terms or at least forcing something else um, to happen to get on terms with, with Molima. But once he, was, once he was away and there was proper daylight, well, I don't think there was anyone would, would have been able to close the door, even if there had been a concerted chase behind. I think we saw a bit of Roglic's sort of... Well, I would almost call it naivety still. I mean, we know that he's relatively new to um, professional cycling still. Um, although he's 29, he's only been a pro for four or five years. Um, and also he hasn't contended for many one-day races. But um, I think, you know, it was a classic example of the being a favourite that everyone has sort of acknowledged. Um, he also had the strongest team. But he had the strongest team up until the moment, the very moment when his last domestique um, pulled off. And at that point, it immediately became a very dangerous situation for him. Um, it became almost an emergency because um, all of a sudden he was surrounded by lots of single riders who didn't have um, teammates, but were not going to were not going to help with any chasing if someone like Molima got away. Um, so therefore, Roglic was, you know, he was the man who was going to have to do that if, if attack, an attack did go. Um, and obviously, if he, if he had just chased on his own, which he was probably strong enough to do, then he was, he was a sitting duck and someone else would have gone and, and, and other riders would have sort of attacked him in, in flurries. So, um, I mean, it, it was almost, I was sort of sitting watching it and, and, and as soon as he was isolated, as soon as I saw Roglic on his own, it was kind of like um, the crystal maze. If you, if you used to watch that, it was kind of like, get out, get out straight away. Um, you know, he had to do something in that, in that very moment. He couldn't leave it another sort of um, kilometre or so to, to make his move. And then when he did finally make his move, it was belated. It was, it was um, well, it was two or three kilometres too late. And, and as you said, despite him being the, the strongest rider, you could see that with the attack that he did finally make on the other side of the Chivilio, um, it, was, it was to no avail, really. 
Yeah, I mean, when uh, I think he was an outstanding favourite, really, for the race, wasn't he? People recognised that he was really in, in, in great form. He'd never won a one-day race before last week, and then he won two. So he went into Lombardia in great form and with a very strong team. And it was probably his presence in that group that 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 helped Mollema, you know. And, and um, he is... There are few riders in that category, I suppose, of of riders who are consistently probably underestimated. And yet, as you say, Lionel, he's won some big races now. Uh, I think the stage in the Tour de France was in the Massif Central, wasn't it? It was the Roman Bardet stage a couple of years ago. Um, tough courses. You know, San Sebastian is a tough race as well. And, um, you know, you speak to Malaman, he, he will still tell you that he's a GC rider. Um, and, you know, he, he finished... He was well up there on GC at the Giro this year wasn't he? Fifth um, I think. Fifth yeah so he still and I've, I've asked him this myself whether having won some some big races and, and you know he won that stage at the Tour a couple of years ago because he'd fallen out of, of the GC picture uh, and I think it was after that I said, you, know, do you, you know you clearly can win races do you not fancy doing that instead of, of riding for GC but he was absolutely adamant that uh, he sees himself first and foremost as a GC rider and yet no, now he's won a monument he's won San Sebastian and um, you know it, it, it's one of these kind of decisions that you, you you question a little bit he also finished third in the 2011 Vuelta this year remarkably <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah that's of course right. yeah <laughs> great result one of the notable aspects of last week's racing in Italy though um, all those beautiful kind of autumnal races was the presence of all three Grand Tour winners from this year Um, not only riding but quite um, aggressive and and factors in the race we haven't seen that for a few years but Roglic obviously the winner of the Vuelta Richard Carapaz the winner of the Giro it's not really done a, an awful lot since the Giro admittedly and uh, Egan Bernal um, who was third in Lombardia um, Valverde was, was second uh, and um, he won in Gran Piemonte uh, last week as well Bernal um, and that was a race that was very dear to him because he used to live in that area when he first came over to uh, to Italy to ride for Gianni Savio's team. Um, and I, I was curious about, well, him in particular, why he, as a Tour de France winner, was, was still racing in October and why he targeted these races. Um, so I spoke to him the day before Lombardia, and uh, here's what he said. It's very unusual for a Tour de France winner to still be racing. It hasn't happened in recent years. You've come out to Italy, you're riding all these one-day races. You won yesterday, you're riding Lombardia tomorrow. Um, was that a choice? Is that something that you wanted to do? Yeah, sure. I I, I try to, to continue, tra- to continue st- training uh, well in Colombia. Maybe not... Uh, really really focused like for uh, the tour but uh, I still re- riding uh, with the long trains and uh, like I said before enjoying the, the, the bike but uh, not not 100% for the for these races but it was it was also thinking about the, the next year I think that is is good to to finish the season in a good level and maybe not stop uh, after the tour because it's July uh, and you need to, to I think that for me it's better to, to, to sail in the bike and continue racing uh, even if I'm not at, at my 100% but just to, to continue and to stop And but for the next season I think that it uh, will be good that I finish the season at, uh, at this level and yeah, I'm not tired. I'm not uh, um, like uh, suffering to to arrive at at uh, this part of the season, uh, racing or, or training. Just uh, finish the season in a good performance uh, for the for the next season. And I mean, looking at your career as a whole, people tend to be quite specialist I mean Vincenzo Nibali who's here as well is a rider who's won Grand Tours and one day classics would you also like to win a variety of races would you like to try and win races like maybe Liege Bastogne Liege Il Lombardia as well as the, the Grand Tours 
yeah, for sure I would like, but uh, uh, also I would like to to win Paris Roubaix, but uh, for okay. sure, for it's sure, exclusive. For, for sure I will not. Uh, I think that, yeah, maybe in the future I I could improve a little bit more this this kind of races, but uh, I think that. Uh, what I what I saw this this season is that I am a rider for the uh, stage races, so I, I want to 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 be focused on that and maybe to to try to to gain to win again some big race like a Giro or Tour again or the Vuelta will be really nice and to be focused on that and then if I if I win one day race for sure uh, will be really nice and I will enjoy it but uh, like I say I want to to just uh, be focused in in the um, in the stage races and Olympic Games next year is that a, a target for you I don't know I don't know it's really difficult to me to arrive there and to 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 win uh, even to to have a medal is, is difficult but but it's the Olympics. It's for the country. Maybe, yeah. Well, if I am in a good level, uh, and if I if I can organize the, the season, and I, and if I can arrive there, uh, in a good level for sure, I will go there. And like in any race, I will do my my best and to try to to do something. But uh, it's difficult to me to to win this kind of races. So that was Egan Bernal, first Colombian winner of the Tour de France, of course. Um, part of a, a much longer interview that will be our friend's special next year. That should come out in January or February next year. Um, but the revelation there that he wants to win Pyro Bay. Good luck, no, Egan. No, he doesn't really. He clarified that. But, you know, he, he clearly is looking on his career as being more about more than just the Tour de France. Um, and, you know, he wanted to try and win Lombardia, um, given which I was surprised that he rode on, on, on Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday and Saturday, um, maybe didn't give himself the best chance, but, um, but he rode well on Saturday and, you know, it's clearly a race that he can win. The other race at the weekend, though, was a Paris Tour. And is it no longer a, a sprinter's race? Because for many years it was known as a sprinter's race, but with the addition of the, the, the dirt roads, maybe that's not the case anymore. Well, I think that much is evident. It was um, it was like a spring classic held in the autumn, wasn't it? Um, the the gravelly Apart roads. from the fact there was no De Kooning quick step. There weren't that well. That was that was what I was going to say because there was a kerfuffle last year, wasn't there, with the addition of some of these um, these farm tracks. Really, they they are not really gravel roads, are they? They're, they're well. There's a mixture, but it's not quite like the white roads of the Strada Bianca race. Where it's uh, it's much more of a sort of farm track type surface um, rather than gravel. And De Kuhn and Quick Step last year had a lot of mechanical problems, mm. and Patrick Lefebvre watching the race at home tweeted that they would never return to it. The real reason for all their mechanical problems, according to another team, was that the Kuhn and Quick Step had locked the keys for the equipment truck in the truck and couldn't recce uh, the course and use the wrong tyres, <laughs> the wrong pressures. Uh, that was the theory of another team that will remain nameless, but um, the Kuhn and Quick Step did have a lot of mechanical problems and punctures and so on, but we saw that at the weekend as well, didn't we? The defending champion Soren Crow Anderson had a a, a puncture a very unfortunate moment for him when he was off the front yeah I mean uh, it's a difficult one this because visually it was it was fantastic to watch it looked really good and, and I thought if there was a stronger field this has got the makings of a sort of a, a, a race oh, it not not on a par with Paris Roubaix, but certainly more interesting than watching a, a sprinter's classic. And I suppose, well, the sprinters they have quite a lot of opportunities in the Grand Tours, don't they? And I, I wonder whether, as a as a televisual spec spectacle, whether other than sort of Milan San Remo, which has got a lot more kind of nuance and interest to it, I wonder whether there's really a place at the end of the season when you know perhaps sort of TV viewers' enthusiasm is is uh, is 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 waning as the, as the season winds down whether you know 
there's really room for a race that even with the insertion of some climbs as they did a sort of five or six years ago in the finale to sort of break it up really Paris Tour have become a race to watch for sort of 15 20 minutes at, at the end and this has totally changed that on the other hand um, Soren Kral Anderson had a you know a very badly timed puncture and couldn't get a proper service and then made a big effort and then was passed by people and his race was um, was done and dusted so you know they're quite a high level of lottery and luck um, in the, the the parkour of Paris Tour but um, to, to write it off as Johan Brunil did on Twitter as well I mean I just think there's got to be room for something that's a little bit different and and there's no there's nothing to say that Paris Tour can't change its culture change its character sorry absolutely entirely if, if that's what um, what the race organisers in this case ASO deem is in the, the best future health of the event well, I think uh, Lionel certainly the last two editions um, which have featured the Chemin de Vigne the um, wine tracks vineyard tracks have um, well, they've they've been more memorable certainly than the previous ten editions. And um, if sort of sprinters have grievances now about um, this, you know, an opportunity to land a big classic late in the season being denied to them, then um, well, it's it's kind of their fault because for years they shunned it. You know, the best sprinters of their generation, the Cavendishes, the Kittles, the Griples, they shunned Paris Nice and never really showed it. Um, Paris Tour. Sorry, Paris, Paris Tour. Um, and never really showed it the sort of the, the kind of um, respect or deference that um, the, the, the great classic riders had in the past. Um, and, and, you know, I think it, it's, uh, I think it's quite sort of promising the way this sort of new restyled Paris Tour has, has started, the, you know, these first two editions. I mean, uh, Strade Bianche is, is already... You know, after a decade and a half, it's kind of vaunted as this um, fantastic fixture, nearly monument um, in the cycling calendar. But but that wasn't an, an instant hit, not to the extent that it is um, now. And I think um, I think there's there's definite potential for for Paris Tour in its current guise. And, and as you said, it looks absolutely fantastic. And you know, I think if if Sunday's race had been ridden on the more traditional course, um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily be um, here dedicating quite as much time to, to talking about it because if you'll forgive the expression, it was really dying on the vine as a race. Um, the quality of the field was sort of diminishing um, every year. Well, partly that was because in 2008 it moved down from the top level pro tour as it was called then world tour now and and, uh, so it isn't part of the world tour now so that undoubtedly has a big impact on the level of the field but you're absolutely right Daniel Um, it's just by the end of the afternoon I I couldn't help wishing I had a nice glass of Vouvray to go with it I don't know why that was well of course it's time of year when we wave goodbye to some riders isn't it not that many big retirements this winter but one uh, Notable one is Lawrence Ten Dam, who the CCC rider. It still seems strange saying that because he moved across from Sunweb only this year, but he is retiring, and he's been a guy who's been interesting to follow, uh, an interesting career, an interesting guy to speak to. And I think you did speak to him uh, quite recently, Daniel, didn't you? Well, it was actually a couple of years ago, Rich, but um, it was sort of um, well, we we talked about the whole of Lawrence Ten Dam's career, and he's always been a fairly um, unconventional rider in the sense that um, he made no bones about the fact that the thing he enjoyed most about being a professional cyclist was um, the sort of barbecues. adventure that were well, barbecues and um, you know how it, it gave him um, a, an outlet for this sort of adventurous spirit that he had um, and you know there was a time in his career when um, he was enjoying quite a lot of success when he was at the um, what was formerly the Rabobank team um, and is now um, Jumbo Visma and he finished ninth in the Tour de France um, in 2014 but this was actually well, what should have been the sort of pinnacle of Ten Dam's career um, actually led into a pretty miserable year when well in his own words he, he became a bit too sort of serious and forgot why he was in um, he was in professional cycling in the first place and, and we spoke about this a couple of years ago at the um, Sunweb launch and um, yeah we'll just hear a bit about that now and also um, the, the, where this sort of where his conception of cycling and as I said quite an unusual conception of cycling where it came from in the first place so why I'm riding my bike man uh, I started riding my bike really young Actually, my first memory is riding a bike. 
uh, I was lost. I, I was living next to the canal. And I was on my my small Strider bike or something like that, and I was like, "Oh, where am I? Where am I?" And then I had the genius idea: just turn around and go the same way back. And I found my uh, the houseboat where we were living on back. But uh, so this this states already everything. You know, it's about adventuring. You know, when I was 11, 12 years old, old I could go on a holiday in uh, in France. I bought an old uh, an old Peugeot bike from the 70s together with my dad, and I went exploring alone from the campsite. Me, just me and my bike, and we, I was exploring uh, was exploring France, and I could do 80 kilometers without my parents. So no phones, nothing, just a small white paper with the uh, names of the roads I had to take. You know, I was looking on a Michelin map uh, before without GPS. You cannot imagine it right now, but that was how it was. It's all about exploring, and it's still like that. You know, I. Uh, I, I love to explore and the social component is also a big part of it right now, you know, and when, when I meet my friends we like to do first a night ride and then a barbecue and drink a beer or... And the thing was I, I put too much pressure on the result for myself, you know, the, day, the two years before I became 13th and 9th in the Tour de France and I want to do even better, 6th, 5th, you know, I thought it was possible but then I, I trained more, I dieted more. And I, felt I was more focused on the numbers and I forgot, forgot how I did it the years before. I tried to do more and then it all went backwards and no results, no nothing. And then, uh, then uh, I got hit from a car from behind on the training ride just after the tour, broke my back, broke, uh, I don't know, a lot of things. And I was like, fuck, you know, I don't like it anymore. And I told my wife, let's go to the US and race, race in a small team there or something like that. And uh, that's what we did. So it was basically the accumulation of of being too focused one year long and having too much because of the focus and also too much pressure and stuff like that. That I started to go back to where I started and uh, explore new areas. And that was the whole area of Santa Cruz, California, where a lot of where a lot of uh, cycling started because it's. Uh, Keith Bonfrager is from there, Santa Cruz Bikes, uh, I don't know, Giro, it's like, so I found uh, like the founding place of mountain biking, which is actually really cool, and uh, I did a lot of mountain biking there, and I explored gravel racing, a new segment I never did before, and now, I really, now I'm also more into that, so I found new uh, interests, and three years later I'm still racing. Yeah, so I thought I thought that was quite sort of timely and pertinent, chaps, to um, just to just to hear that from Lawrence Tindam at, at the end of his career. And, and sure enough, you know, true to um, the way he's approached cycling over the past couple of years, I think he finished Tour of Lombardy on Saturday and got straight back on his bike and headed off with Sam Uman, um, former teammate at Sunweb, and they're on some kind of jaunt, some kind of expedition heading towards Rome, I think. Um, as we're recording this. Well, it's good to hear Sam Oman is, is back on his bike because he had an iliac artery operation, didn't he, earlier this year? Um, and that was a pretty serious operation after the Giro. Um, so he's a very promising young talent. But Ten Dam, we should explain the barbecue reference. He has, he has barbecued meat every night. Is that correct? I think, so. I think he has a barbecue every day, yeah. I think he claims to be the... The world record holder for consecutive barbecues. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, not, not, very, wow. not very fashionable these days. <laughs> we should, sure we should that. Hit that. We should invite him to the penultimate stage of the Tour de France, from Lure to La Planche de Belfi, and <laughs> see, whether, <laughs> see whether he fancied a bit of barbecued finger from the man at our uh, guest house from a couple of years ago. <laughs> and, and are, we, are we staying there again, Rich? No. Oh. <laughs> Odd, oddly enough, a, a, a teammate and, I think, friend, a long-time and teammate of Simon Geschke, who is um, one of the only vegan riders in the peloton. Oh, I didn't know he was vegan. Mm. Ah, interesting. Um, right, well, should we uh, should we wrap things up for this uh, week? We seem to be we're being invaded here, um, Lionel, by some ch- some children uh, who are congregating in large numbers on the south bank. Um, quite quite threatening i thought you were going to say pigeons they're no, pretty, no, no. pretty threatening looking no, gangs of children are, are are approaching um we should uh, we should wrap things up um but um what you look like going to say something like uh, i just well, it's just uh, just on the food and wine at the tour I oh mean, yeah that's a really important business daniel from a wine point of view is it a good tour or uh, or um, an average vintage 
it, it's a decent it's a decent vintage napalm in the sense that we spend a lot of time in the southeast um not quite i don't think venturing into cote du rhone territory or chateauneuf du pape but and a lot of good wines in that area sort of privas um cisteron as well and um, unfortunately we sort of bypass um by plane, I think, according to the map. Anyway, we bypassed the whole of the uh, Bordelais, the Bordeaux um, wine-growing region, when we head up from Po to the um, to the Ile de Ré. So that's a bit of a shame, I must admit. I don't, I don't think we'll be bypassing it by plane, though, will we, <laughs> no, we Lionel? Won't. We won't. We'll be able to. That's yeah. There's a nice rest day in uh, La Rochelle if you just don't go Ile de Ré. I think it's going to be difficult to stay on Ile de Ré, but you can have a nice couple of days on La Rochelle. Um, which I'm looking forward to immensely. We do go to Bourg en Bresse, but there's mm. a stage start there, so it might be difficult to. Are we not there the night before chicken. for the chicken? Um, no, because there's a big transfer up there mm. from the previous day. Um, I can't remember which uh, stage that is, but um, yeah, um, it's yeah quite a quite a big drive up. So I'm not sure if we'll get any Bourg en Bresse chicken. I'm afraid. Lyle. Well, that saves the controversy, doesn't it? I mean, I think we got we got the raw deal last time we were there. We didn't get raw chicken. We got cooked chicken, but uh, we got a raw deal because I think I think they sensed there were a few chicken sceptics among our group that night. Mm. Well, anyway. well, we'll get back there at some point. Well, we've got seven or eight months to digest the tour route, haven't we? So it's going to, well, as it always does, the, all roads lead to Nice in the first half of 2020. Um, plenty of time to talk about what the tour may or may not throw at us and throw at the riders. Yes, that's. we should wrap things up for this week. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps. Just before we go this week, let's hear a little excerpt from our new episode of Service Course, which is out later this week, presented by Tom Wally and Lizzie Banks, the big lot rider who, of course, won a stage of the Giro Rosa earlier this year. This episode is all about data bias and how that affects equipment, design, clothing, etc. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's out later this week. We really are so used to seeing men as the default that most people aren't aware that they are ignoring women. There are some things that, like, currently I'm really frustrated about, and it's exactly that, that it's based on men and not women. We all vary with some shorter arms. I mean, I've just built a frame for a guy with achondroplasia, which is otherwise known as dwarfism, and that's all working out really well, but that's an example of a, a real outlier and uh, we're we're all around really you are listening to service course by the cycling podcast the stories behind the bikes oh what an amazing moment you know the crowds were kind of 10 deep all the way through Otley and uh... with Tom Worley and Lizzie Banks it was just a spine tingling moment something that's never going to happen again in my career <laughs>